One of the favorite things that I used to do with my son uh, when we lived in Colorado is there was a, a national park there where we lived called Black Canyon of the Gunnison. If you've never been there, you need to go there if you're on vacation sometime. It's a beautiful, beautiful national park. And we would go camping up there. And, uh, and it was really, really beautiful, especially during the daytime when you would go. You get to see the canyon, and, and you could hear the, the rushing water. Even though 2,000 feet down, you could still hear the water uh, rushing uh, during the daytime. But at nighttime, it was still beautiful. Uh, even though you couldn't see down into the canyon, uh, at nighttime, there was a whole different type of, of beauty. You could still get all the sounds. You could still hear the sound of the river uh, at nighttime. You could, you could hear the, all of, the, all of the, uh, the wildlife that was around. Uh, um, every, every twig breaking sounded like there was a bear behind you. You know, At nighttime, everything kind of augments, doesn't it? And so, so especially when you're out away from the city lights, one of the, one of the really incredible things was is when you're out away from the city lights in, in a place that's big and open like that, you get to see the stars. I mean, really see the stars. I mean, you see a few stars uh, when, when you're in the city here, but when you're away from all the lights, when you're, when you're out there and it is dark, God shines through. You see trillions and trillions of, of stars. And, and, and so when it's dark, you know, um, everything seems bigger, doesn't it? Everything seems louder. And the same thing is true when things are dark for us personally. You see, there are some of us who, who as we walk through dark times, um, everything in our life gets augmented in the dark. Whether, whether it's a dark place spiritually, whether it's a dark place emotionally, uh, whether it's a dark place just in, in general, we, um, everything seems bigger than it really is. If somebody's whispering, we're sure that they're whispering about us. When, when, when things uh, don't go quite our way, we're sure it's some sort of, of conspiracy. When, when, when things are, are, are really bad and we feel like we're all alone, some even believe that God is silent. But the truth is, God is louder in the dark. It's just sometimes, as we talked about a few weeks ago, we're just not conditioned to hear him. See, there are some that would say that if you are a Christian, that you will never experience any of these, these dark times. If you're a Christian, then everything's always going to be fine. Everything's going to be wonderful. But the problem with that is, that's just not true. The guy that we're going to talk about today is a guy by the name of Elijah. He's a prophet in the Bible. And, and I don't think sometimes we realize just how important Elijah was. Elijah was one of the most important characters in all of Scripture. Uh, we know that because uh, he was one of two people that never saw death. Uh, Enoch, if you, if you want to look that up, this is true. Enoch uh, was walking with God and, and he was with God. He was just gone. He, he, didn't, he didn't experience death. Elijah was brought up in a, in a whirlwind. And so right off the bat, when you hear the name of Elijah, Elijah was a pretty important guy because he and Enoch were the only ones who didn't die. Even Jesus died before he was resurrected. Uh, and so if that weren't enough, uh, he was one of two that uh, was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and his disciples. When Jesus took his disciples up, uh, they transfigured and they showed both Moses and Elijah. It was important enough for Elijah to be there. A lot of times when people asked, who is Jesus? They compared Jesus to Elijah. Elijah was one of the most important people in Scripture. And so if there was any person who, who you would think that God was always with them, that always knew that God was going to be with them, you would think that it was Elijah. Elijah was the prophet of God. He was the one who, who uh, did all kinds of incredible things. And, and, and we even talked a few weeks ago about, uh, about an incredible story of Elijah where, where he was kind of, uh, uh, he called down fire from heaven to, 
to consume a water-soaked uh, sacrifice after the prophets of Baal had done all of their best to get their gods to do the same thing. And, and Elijah kind of, kind of said, hey, you know, uh, speak a little louder. Maybe your, your gods are asleep. He even, he even went so far as to say, maybe your god's in the bathroom. We talked about that. I hope you went back and read that to see that I wasn't lying. He, you know, he, he, he did all these wonderful things. And, and then after the consuming of that, of that, uh, of that sacrifice, then, then uh, we see where he, he killed 450 prophets of, of Baal. And even after his greatest high, we're going to look at today one of his greatest lows. Right after all of this, Elijah's ready to give it up. That doesn't make sense, does it? He is probably one of the most important people in the Bible. Surely that's not true because if, if God's blessing you, then you never have those moments. But, but Elijah was having those moments. Have you ever noticed that sometimes our lowest lows come after our highest highs? That's where Elijah was. And if you have your Bibles with you, if you want to turn with me to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 19. And we're going to pick up right after um, Elijah uh, is victorious and kills the 450 prophets of, of Baal. And start at verse 1. And it says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, including the way that he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. Elijah, you win. I give up. It's not what she says. That would have made sense, right? I mean, after all, Elijah just did something pretty incredible. But Jezebel's response was, may the gods, the gods who couldn't, by the way, consume the sacrifices, May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Pretty ridiculous. I mean, when you think about it, and, and when, there's, when we look at this scripture, there, there, there are several ridiculous things that are going to come out, and this is the first ridiculous one, is, is that here was Jezebel, and, and even though Elijah had defeated her gods, um, she swore by the gods that were defeated that if, um, if she hadn't killed Elijah by the next morning, may she die. The same way that Elijah uh, had, had killed the, uh, the rest of, of, of those people. And, and so she was just really, really uh, going after Elijah, even though Elijah had proved himself, he had proved God. And, and when we look at this, it seems really ridiculous, doesn't it? But that's the kind of world we live in, isn't it? You see, time and time again, the, the, the troubles that we run into are, are because there are people who, for some reason or another, just can't uh, intellectually get their mind around the fact that God is all-powerful and that God is able to, 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 to give us uh, what we need to, to live this world. God is able to do the things that, that uh, only God can do, and, and God is able to, to perform miracles. God is able to bring salvation. And, and so we have all these wonderful things that, that we talk about, all these things that happen in our lives that hopefully we, we testify to other people about um, that are happening in our lives, and we tell them what good God we serve and, and how much he loves us and how much he cares for us. And and even after we do all of that, there's always that, for lack of a better term, Jezebel, isn't there? That's not true. Your God's not powerful. You can't really overcome anything. Even after God has shown himself, it's really not much different. It's in the time of today than it, than it was in the time of Elisha. But, but that's uh, uh, one of the first ridiculous things we see. And then the next ridiculous thing we see starts at verse 3, where Elijah then was afraid after this threat. threat. And he fled for his life. Now, let me set a little bit of the scene. Because when we read this, we're thinking, Elijah... How in the world did you not see death? 
You, you didn't believe in God. But, but here's the truth. He, he had just been through this, this wonderful high. He, he had just been through an all-day experience where not only uh, did he have to sit and endure uh, pagan practices, and not only did he have to uh, throw insults at them, and not only did he do all of those things, and not only did he call down fire from God, but after it was all done, he had to kill 450 prophets of Baal by himself. It stands to reason he'd be a little tired. It takes a lot to kill 450 prophets of Baal. And so he's exhausted mentally, spiritually, and physically. And even though he'd been through the highest of highs, this queen says, I'm going to kill you. And it was just basically the straw that broke the camel's back. And Elijah was afraid. And he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servants there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness. So now, not only is he tired, not only is he overwhelmed, he's alone. Traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. See, by this time, he's had time to, to process. As he's talking about uh, at this particular point in time, he's not saying, Lord, I want to die because he's scared. Because why was he scared to begin with? He was scared because uh, Jezebel said she was going to kill him. And, and now he's at a place where, where he's alone and he's with God and he's saying, I, I just want to die. And so he's not really scared at this point. Here's what he is as we, as we follow up. He says, uh, I pray that he might die. He says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. In other words, what he's saying is, God, I preach. I teach. I judge. I kill 450 prophets of Baal. I call down fire from heaven. And nobody's listening to me. I'm doing everything that you've called me to do. I'm doing everything that you've told me to do. I'm saying everything that you've told me to say. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. For some reason, God, I thought I was the guy that was going to get Israel back on track. But I'm no better than the people that were before me. Lord, I've had enough of this life. I want to escape. And the story goes on. Verse 5. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. Pretty anticlimactic, huh? You know, we would expect that God would have opened up the skies. The guy would have said, hey, you know what, Elijah, it'll be okay. But after he spills his guts to God, he lays down, he sleeps under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and, and beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he you lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up, and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Okay, this is one of those parts in Scripture that sometimes you read through and you say, Something's missing. Elijah just spilled out his guts. Uh, Elijah is, 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 is now asleep, and, and God provides food for him. We say, man, that's a plus. That's a start. That's what God's doing. 
king, and, and he provides an angel to come and, and to minister to him and to watch over him as he, as he gets his strength back. And, and then he helps him to get his strength back by giving him food and by giving him water. And, and, and he goes to sleep again. And we're looking at this and we're thinking something's missing. And surely as we read on, something's going to change. And, and then we read, then, then, then the Lord woke him up again and he gave him more food and he gave him more water. And he said, you're going to need this for the journey. Is God not going to deal with Elijah's concerns? You see, at this point, God isn't responding to Elijah. He's not responding to his poured out heart. He's not responding, at least in the way that, that we think he should. What he's doing is he's preparing him for a journey. And so then we, when we continue on there, uh, he says, uh, so, so he got up and he ate and he drank the food that God, and he gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, where he came to a cave where he spent the night. And so he didn't even give him enough food uh, just, just to make him, him feel good. He didn't give him food just so that he could, could feel like God was looking over him. He gave him food so that now he could travel 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God, which is kind of what you had to do if you wanted to be with God in the Old Testament. And so he didn't really make it easy for him. It was still a rough journey. Elijah was still dealing with stuff. There was no answers to what Elijah had, had brought to God yet, that there was nothing there except God taking care of him. He didn't try to say, hey, you didn't pray right. He didn't say, you know what, if you, if you just do this, this, and this, then, then I'm going to be able to bless you beyond measure, and I'm going to be able to give you all of this stuff. What he did was he fed him, he gave him something to drink, he gave him an angel to minister to him, so that he could continue a difficult journey. Forty days and forty nights it took him to get to the presence of God. Sound like a God we want to follow yet? If we're honest, no. I got enough trouble. I think God's going to help me. Here's my order. Fix it. God didn't even do this for one of the top five characters of the Bible. But he takes him to the cave. Then he continues. But the Lord said, then the Lord said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Really, God? I just told you. But I will tell you again. Verse 10. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Kind of confusing when you think about it, right? He was scared because Jezebel was going to kill him. He got his senses back and, and then he prays to God, take my life. And then he complains to God, everybody's doing everything that they shouldn't be doing. I've been giving my life to everything and, and all the prophets are dead. I'm the only one left. I'm doing this all by myself and now they want to kill me too. Now all of a sudden, He's interested in his life. And so surely God's going to answer him in this moment. But instead, verse 11 says, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But guess what? The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. And the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. He wasn't in the lightning bolt experience.
God didn't feel that he needed to respond to Elijah with power. This goes on. He says, and after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. And he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. This is when God's going to speak and give him the answer to his problem. And a voice said, what are you doing here? Elijah. <laughs> kind of comical when you think about it. Kind of funny. Anticlimactic. And, and he said, well, maybe he didn't hear me the first time. And so he replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. So now God's going to give him the answer. Verse 15. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came. And travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nemishai, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Mahala, to replace you. To replace you. as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. The one who will replace him, right? Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed to Baal or kissed him. In case you're wondering, he never answers all his questions. But what he does is he cares for him. He feeds him. He gives him water for the journey. And after he's rested, instead of patting him on the back and giving him that lightning bolt moment, he says, go back to work. In other words, life is hard. It's hard because of sin. You be faithful, Elisha. And I will care for your needs. You be careful, Elijah. And I will fulfill my promise for you. You be faithful, Elijah. And listen to my voice instead of all of the other voices that are around you. And I will do what I said that I will do. Because part of this explanation was I'm going to wipe out everybody who's following Baal. That's not your responsibility. I'm going to put a mechanism into place where, where the people that escape this king will be killed by this king and the people that escape this king will be killed by your replacements. And there'll be 7,000 that are left that did not bend their knee. But through it all, Elijah, you're going to be with me. My angel comforted you. And we started off by talking about the fact that Elijah never tasted death. And he was with God. In other words, quit looking for an escape. 
Quit looking for a better day. And let me comfort you. Let me feed you. Let me quench your thirst so that you can continue the hard journey of life. On one hand, that doesn't seem really uplifting for us, does it? See, on one hand, we, we, we hear that and we're like, oh, but there's all kinds of stuff in the Bible about God blesses and God gives you this blessing. And if you do this, then you get that. Well, the truth is there's none of that. See, the promises of God are not in exchange for anything that you do. See, there's nothing that you and I can do that forces God to do anything. Amen? Now, there's nothing that we do that forces God to bring us happiness. There's nothing that God does to force us, to, to force God to make our life so much better than everybody else's life. There's just, this, there's just this acknowledgement that because of sin in the world, this life will never be what it was intended to be. And it's not that it's okay, it's just kind of the way that it is. In the midst of it, the promise that we have, the blessing that we have, is that God never leaves us, that he never forsakes us. Even though things are hard, even though things are difficult, even though we're walking through saying, God, I, I have preached, I've been at church, I come to small group, I sing the songs, I put up with the long-winded preacher. And yet, he still preaches long. Nobody's listening to me. And some of us have probably, if we're, if we're honest, been to the place where we said, Lord, take me. I've been there. I've been there. Sometimes you look at the news, sometimes you listen to the ridiculousness out there. You're like, Lord, I'm done. And then he doesn't answer us the way we think he should answer us. But he feeds us. He gives us water. He sends his angels to minister to us so that we can finish the journey. See, that's the blessing that the rest of the world does not have. That's the blessing we seek. Any blessing other than that is short of God's best for us. No amount of money, no amount of fame, no amount of health fills the hole that's inside of us for meaning. And so those things should not be front and center of our life. See, the community of faith goes beyond this, this idea of, 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 Lord, you just got to make sure that, that I'm going to make it through because he's gonna, you're going to make it through. He's going to bless you, but, but you have to get to a place where you listen to his voice instead of look for the earthquake, instead of looking for the wind, instead of looking for the fire. And hear his loud whisper. Because in the darkness, if you are listening, his whisper can drown out everything else. That's the God we serve. Do you ever think about it that way? I, I never did. You know, I was growing up, I, I always thought that's how God spoke. God spoke in a whisper and the more holy. He was talking the softer God. 
so that I would have to listen. I talked a few weeks ago about the miracle of a hearing surgery and being able to hear an air conditioner. One of the other things that having a hearing problem helped me to do was learn how to listen. Because I couldn't hear. And so when I was in school, um, what I learned to do is if I, if I wanted to pass, if I wanted to make good grades, I had to listen. And so I'd make sure that I sat in the right place. And I would listen. And, and I even got to the place where I just never took notes. And I would, even have, uh, I would even have teachers and professors give me a hard time about that. They're like, well, I'm so glad you're so smart. I'm like, isn't that I'm so smart? It's been my whole life I've learned how to listen. And so when we listen, the difference between listening and hearing is, is when you listen, the information penetrates. When you hear, it bounces off. <laughs> when you hear, you know, some of you wives know what I'm talking about, right? There's a difference between when your husband listens to you and when your husband hears. You know, and, and so guys, here's my advice for you. Don't ever tell your wife, I hear ya. That does not mean that you listened. And part of the reason that we don't hear from God is we don't, anybody want to see it? Listen. Because we already know how God's supposed to fix that. We already know what God's supposed to do. We already know how he's supposed to operate. But the crazy thing about God, as this story has shown, is that he rarely does it the way we think he should. Because he's not in the earthquake. He's not in the fire. He's not in the wind. He is in the deafening, still, small voice that we have to tune into. And he attends our needs. He feeds us. And he gives us to drink. To finish the journey. So where does the church land in all of this? I have an acquaintance that uh, I read this from her Facebook profile, uh, for her Facebook feed this morning. And this is what she wrote. Her name's uh, Tara, Beth, Tara Beth Leach, and she's a senior pastor at our Pasadena, California, Nazarene Church in Pasadena, California. She wrote this. She says, A Christian community in perpetual fear is a community that fails to comprehend the love and the power of God. And she goes on to quote 1 John 4, 8. She says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I want to read that last part of the scripture again. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The one who fears is not sanctified. That's what that's saying. It's not me, that's, that's what God's saying. Then she goes on to say this. Maybe it's fear that causes strife. Maybe it's fear that causes division. Maybe it's fear that hinders hospitality. And maybe it's fear that hinders love, and maybe it's fear that hinders generosity. I want you to think about all those things, strife, division, lack of hospitality, lack of generosity, lack of love. What usually precedes us withholding that? Fear. We have strife because we fear that somebody's going to take something away from us. We have division because we want to protect what's ours. We don't give hospitality because what if it's not appreciated? We don't give generously because what if I don't have enough for myself? And we don't love because 
What if someone takes advantage of that love? God feeds us. He gives us water. He gives us comfort to finish the journey that he's called us to, to continue to be a people of love. No matter what anyone has done to you, the only way we will finish the journey that God has for us is to listen to his voice and live a life without fear, replaced by love.